Low Zetas. With a reputation striking fear into the bravest of hearts, this drug syndicate is responsible for unimaginable atrocities. From massacres to flames, their crimes defy belief. But before we delve deeper into the worst crimes tied to their name, let's get reacquainted with who these people are. From elite soldiers to cartel enforcers, the late 1990s, it marked the beginning of the notorious Los Zetas, originally formed by deserters from an elite unit of the armed forces serving the Gulf Cartel. These individuals would go on to establish themselves as one of the most powerful and feared cartels in Mexico. The mid-2000s, Los Zetas decided to break away from the Gulf Cartel and forge their own path. They launched a relentless offensive, expanding their influence not only throughout Mexico, but also into Guatemala. What set Los Zetas apart was their military military background and sheer ruthlessness. The U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, or DEA, even described him as the most technologically advanced, sophisticated, and violent among similar paramilitary enforcement groups. And let us tell you, their infamous reputation for sheer brutality was more than justified. Los Zetas were notorious for employing shock and awe tactics, engaging in heinous acts such as beheadings, torture, and indiscriminate murder. And while their primary focus was drug trafficking, they also dabbled in profitable gun racketeering, assassinations, extortion, kidnappings, and various other illegal activities. And unlike other cartels, Los Zetas didn't rely on alliances. Instead, they instilled terror in their enemies. They would torture their victims, display bodies as a warning, and unleash violence without discrimination. Even though their military training may have diminished over time, their brutality remained unmatched. In fact, rival cartels, desperate to combat Los Zetas, began adopting some of their tactics, further escalating unprecedented violence all over Mexico. So now brace yourselves, as we're about to unveil the jaw-dropping tales behind six of their their most horrifying crimes. Buckle up, people. It's about to get dark and twisted. Number 1. The First San Fernando Massacre August 23, 2010, a man who had been shot in the jaw approached a security checkpoint near the town of San Fernando in Tamaulipas, just 160 kilometers from the U.S. border. He told the troops that he was the lone survivor of a brutal mass killing that had taken place on a nearby ranch. The Navy troops wasted no time and headed towards that property, engaging in a fierce gun battle with the criminals. What they discovered was truly horrifying. A staggering 72 bodies piled up in an outside storehouse. The survivor, an 18-year-old Ecuadorian named Luis, began recounting how the tragedy unfolded. He shared that he had left his homeland and traveled to Honduras, then made his way to Guatemala. From there, he embarked with several other migrants on a speedboat journey to Mexico, and eventually reached the coastal state of Veracruz, where he was transported to Tamaulipas. August 22, 2010, around 10 p.m., three trucks surrounded the vehicle Lewis was traveling in. About eight heavily armed men emerged from the trucks and forcibly took the migrants, including Lewis, in two of the vehicles. They were then brought to a secluded house, where they were held for a day before being taken to a warehouse where the massacre occurred. Lewis described how the migrants were led into the warehouse in a row and had their eyes blindfolded upon entering. They were made to stand for approximately 20 minutes, during which Lewis speculated they were waiting for nightfall. Eventually, they were instructed to lean against the wall with their backs facing it. The gunmen warned him to be quiet and refrain from screaming, threatening to kill him if they disobeyed. However, their fate had already been determined, regardless of their actions. Suddenly, the shooting started, and Luis found himself in the midst of it. One of the migrants bravely shouted that he wasn't afraid of the attackers. Sadly, he too was shot. The migrants were systematically shot one by one until it was Luis's turn. They shot him too, but fortunately his wound wasn't fatal, and he was smart enough to pretend that he was dead. Once the killers left the warehouse, Luis waited for a couple of minutes before mustering the courage to flee. He walked throughout the night, desperately searching for help. Eventually, he spotted a faint light in the distance and managed to reach a nearby house, pleading for assistance. However, the frightened occupants refused to help him, knowing that they might face the same fate if they did. Luis had no choice but to continue walking until sunrise. At around 6 a.m., he finally saw some Mexican Marines and asked for help. Try to imagine what those poor people had to go through. Why do you think Los Zetas decided they deserve such a brutal fate? 
According to Luis, those 72 people were killed because they didn't have enough money to pay for the ransom. The heartless killers then try to force him to work as hitmen for Los Zetas, promising him $1,000 every 15 days. However, all the immigrants refused, and sadly, they all had to pay the ultimate price. When the authorities finally arrived in the area, swooping in with a helicopter, on the ground, Los Zetas hitmen guarding the area greeted him with a hail of bullets. The shootout went on all day, and the Mexican military had to retreat to Matamoros under the cover of darkness to avoid getting ambushed. The next day they returned with more troops and ammo, only to discover the horrifying sight of the 72 bodies. Each one of them was handcuffed and blindfolded. The authorities wasted no time launching their investigation, quickly pointing fingers at the ongoing turf war between Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel. They believe these drug cartels resorted to kidnapping migrants to fund their organization and expand their ranks through ransom and recruitment. June 17, 2011, the federal police finally arrested Edgar Huerta Montiel, also known as El Huache, a high-ranking lieutenant of Los Zetas. They fingered him as the mastermind behind the brutal slaying of the 72 immigrants. Once they had him in custody, El Huatze confessed to how he had orchestrated the abduction of the buses carrying those poor migrants. He even admitted to personally killing 10 of the victims. And if that wasn't enough, he revealed that he had kidnapped other buses near San Fernando, Tamaulipas to rob them of their money, torture them for information, and check if they were secretly working for the Gulf Cartel. The Mexican authorities and media were left reeling by this horrific massacre, labeling it the largest of its kind in the Mexican drug war. It was deemed the most heinous act ever committed by a drug trafficking organization in Mexico. A little did they know, this was only the start. The horrors Los Zetas would be responsible for were far beyond anything they could have ever imagined. Number 2. The Second San Fernando Massacre April 6, 2011, Mexican authorities made a chilling discovery. They stumbled upon 59 bodies buried in eight secret mass graves in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. These graves were located near Mexican Federal Highway 101, a road stretching from Matamoros' border to the state capital, Ciudad Victoria. Locals had given this highway a grim nickname, the Highway of Hell. And for good reason, those who traveled through this highway between 2010 and 11 often came across burned vehicles, bullet-ridden trucks, abandoned on the side of the road, and dead bodies. These bodies, frequently decapitated, were left behind by ruthless drug cartels. The discovery of these bodies was a wake-up call for officials, as it revealed a new and terrifying tactic employed by Mexican drug cartels. They started stopping buses, forcibly removing passengers, many of whom would never be seen again. Just two weeks prior to the grim discovery between March 24th and 29th, 2011, several public transportation buses headed to Reynosa, Tamaulipas, was hijacked in San Fernando. This prompted immediate investigations when suitcases and other belongings were found abandoned on the side of the road. April 8th, 2011. The situation took an even darker turn when Morelos Jaime Canseco, the Secretary General of Tamaulipas, confirmed the discovery of 13 more bodies, bringing the body count to a horrifying 72. April 10th, 2011. As if that wasn't enough, an additional 16 bodies were unearthed from four other mass graves, pushing the death toll to a staggering 88. Investigators soon revealed that the victims were not migrants, as was the case in the previous massacre of 72 migrants in 2010. Instead, they were fellow Mexican citizens. This revelation caused bus lines in Tamaulipas to refuse to take people to San Fernando until this situation was resolved. Witnesses also began reporting that cartel members had set up a fake military checkpoint and stopped multiple buses. They demanded that the passengers pay them up to 300 US dollars in order to continue their journey. April 12th, 2011. As the investigation progresses, the Mexican military confirms the discovery of 28 more bodies, bringing the total to 116. They had uncovered 15 mass graves. April 13th, 
Authorities find an additional six bodies, bringing the toll to 122. The very next day on April 14th, they uncovered 12 more mass graves containing 23 bodies, pushing the body count to 145. Investigators revealed that these victims had been deceased for a period ranging from one to two months. And by that time, they also confirmed that Los Zetas were responsible for carrying out this horrific massacre. April 21, 2011, authorities discovered 32 more bodies in eight other mass graves, raising that death toll to 177. Five days later, on April 26, the body count had reached 183, with over 40 mass graves now uncovered. June 7, 2011, the search for clandestine mass graves in the municipality of San Fernando, Tamaulipas came to an end, with a total of 193 corpses found. Following the massacre, thousands of citizens from San Fernando fled to other parts of Mexico and even the U.S. In response, the Mexican government deployed 650 soldiers to San Fernando and established a military base in the area. By August 23, 2011, authorities had arrested 82 members of Los Edas, along with 16 police officers from San Fernando who were suspected of aiding the cartel in these killings. But these horrors didn't end here. Can you imagine how those innocent people met their tragic end? Investigations have revealed that Los Zetas were using a twisted version of an ancient Roman gladiator sport to groom new assassins and recruit members for their ranks. The kidnapped victims were forced into brutal fights with each other. Armed with knives, hammers, and machetes, these men were coerced at gunpoint to fight for their lives in a gladiator-style contest. The winners of these fights were then ordered to carry out suicide missions, targeting rival drug cartel members in different locations. As for the losers, they were callously buried in mass graves. Almost all the bodies found in these graves showed signs of severe blunt force trauma. But why were these innocent people stopped and killed in the first place? Mexican authorities speculate that Los Zetas may have tried to recruit these passengers as foot soldiers or intended to hold them at ransom or maybe even extort money from them before they could cross into the U.S. However, some of the killers have confessed they abducted and killed these passengers out of fear that their rivals, the Gulf Cartel, were receiving reinforcements from other states through them. One of the leaders even admitted that Heriberto Lascano, the supreme leader of Los Zetas, had ordered the investigation of all buses entering San Fernando. Those who had no involvement were supposedly released, but those connected to the rival cartel were mercilessly killed. The killers also claimed to have gone through the passengers' cell phones and text messages to determine if they had any ties to the Gulf Cartel. They were particularly concerned about buses coming from Durango and Michoacan, two strongholds of the rival La Familia and Sinaloa cartels. In a bid to uncover more information, the federal police decided to question Edgar Huerta Montial once again, the man responsible for the first San Fernando massacre. During the interrogation, Montial confessed that over 600 bodies were buried in secret mass graves located near San Fernando. It's disheartening to note that a huge number of these bodies remain undiscovered. It makes us wonder just how many families out there in Mexico have absolutely no clue about what happened to their loved ones. Well, what is sure is that Los Zetas never regarded human life. In their rap sheet of terror, it's still a mile long and some. Number 3. Monterey Casino Attack August 25th. 2011. A horrifying incident took place in Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico. Members of the notorious Los Zetas gang set a casino ablaze, resulting in the tragic deaths of 52 people. This heart-wrenching arson attack also left over a dozen individuals injured and trapped more than 35 people for hours until Mexican forces finally arrived on scene. According to media reports, the majority of those who lost their lives were women, including one pregnant woman. It's truly devastating to think about innocent lives being taken away in such a senseless act of violence. But to understand the context behind this horrific event, we need to look back at the government's crackdown on drug cartels, which began in 2006. Monterey, in particular, had become a hotbed of violence since 2010 due to the turf war between the Gulf Cartel and Los Zetas. 
Surveillance footage captured the chilling moments when armed gunmen arrived at the entrance of Casino Royale. They swiftly stormed the main entrance, firing at guests and dousing the casino with gasoline before igniting a fire that trapped people inside. This attack was not only the bloodiest in the history of Monterey, but also one of the worst in the entire state of Nuevo León. Now, what motivated these criminals to commit such a heinous act? Casino Royale was part of the Grupo Royale chain, which operated various casinos and entertainment venues across different cities in Mexico. Unfortunately, this particular casino had been targeted before. January 2011, news broke that the establishment had fallen victim to organized crime. An armed squad had entered the premises, terrorizing those inside. Then, on May 25th of the same year, a group of delinquents attacked the casino, brandishing firearms and robbing both customers and the establishment itself. This was just one of several casinos targeted on that fateful day. Now, prior to this tragic event, another betting center owned by Grupo Royale had also been attacked twice by organized crime, although no one was harmed. August 25th, 2011, in Monterey, Nuevo Leon, just minutes before 2 p.m., 12 members of the notorious Los Zetas cartel, accompanied by one of their leaders, gathered at El Gran Pastor restaurant on Gonzalitos Avenue. It was only a few blocks away from the ill-fated Casino Royale. The cartel members were given explicit instructions to carry out an attack on the casino. According to the perpetrators themselves, the motive behind the attack was to send a message to the casino owner for failing to pay extortion money. By 3 p.m., Los Zetas members left the restaurant and made their way to a nearby Pemex gas station in the Valle Verde neighborhood. Their mission? To collect barrels of gasoline. Surveillance videos later confirmed that two pickup trucks arrived at the gas station, filling up large containers with gas before embarking on Gonzalitos Avenue. The second video even captured the chilling moment when the convoy headed towards the casino. At approximately 3.50 p.m., the perpetrators arrived at the casino in a convoy of four vehicles. In a matter of minutes, around eight or nine armed men stormed the premises, causing panic and fear. Some lucky individuals managed to escape, but many were too terrified and chose to hide in the casino. Witnesses say that one of the gunmen hit the receptionist with his assault rifle, while the other guys poured gasoline inside the building from tanks gotten at the gas station. Around 150 croupiers and customers, mostly women, rushed inside the casino from the game area to the bathrooms, stairways, and blocked emergency exits. Some of them heard gunshots and explosions that they thought were grenades going off. A few people managed to escape through the main entrance, but soon enough, the fire made it impossible. The panic caused a stampede, and several others got hurt in this chaos. In just three minutes, the criminals burned down the place and got away, but the whole thing was caught on surveillance video, leading to the perpetrators being arrested. When the emergency crew finally decided to break down the casino's walls, they found piles of bodies in the bathrooms, stairs, and game tables. The following day, Mexican authorities confirmed that 52 people had died, and many more were in the hospital. All 52 victims died from suffocation due to carbon monoxide poisoning. They were hiding in bathrooms and offices, trying to get away from the attackers, and it turned out later that the emergency exits in the casino were locked. The attack was blamed on organized crime, with the Gulf Cartel and Los Zetas being the main suspects. Later on, it was confirmed to be Los Zetas. August 29th, 2011, the governor of Nuevo León announced that the first five suspects behind the casino fire had been brought to justice. These five individuals admitted involvement in the crime that tragically claimed the lives of 52 innocent people. However, they claimed they never intended to kill anyone. Their motive? To give the building owner a good scare, because he had refused to pay a weekly fee of 130,000 pesos, or $10,000, to keep his operations running. But things quickly spiraled out of control. As the investigation unfolded, more gang members were arrested. By January 25th, 2012, a total of 25 people had been apprehended in connection with this horrific massacre. Number 4. Apodaca Prison Riot 
February 19, 2012. Chaos erupted in the prison in Apodaca, Nuevo León, Mexico. A violent riot broke out between the inmates, turning the prison into a war zone. According to Mexico City officials, at least 44 people lost their lives within the mayhem, with another 12 injured. However, the blog Del Narco, an anonymous blog documenting events and people of the Mexican drug war, reported that the actual death toll might have been even higher, possibly exceeding 70 people. Now, what sparked this horrific riot? The answer lies in the ongoing rivalry between Los Zetas and the Gulf Cartel. The victims of this tragedy belong to the Gulf Cartel, making it clear that this was a targeted attack. To make matters worse, 30 inmates managed to escape from the prison during the chaos, as confirmed by the governor of Nuevo León. However, on March 16, 2012, the Attorney General's Office of Nuevo León confirmed that a total of 37 prisoners had escaped during the massacre. Among them was Oscar Manuel Bernal, also known as La Araña, who is considered extremely dangerous by Mexican authorities and is believed to be the leader of Los Zetas in the Monterey municipality. The other fugitives were also affiliated with Los Zetas. So it becomes evident that the riot wasn't a random outbreak of violence, but rather part of a larger scheme orchestrated by Los Zetas. Given their brutal reputation, one can only imagine the horrors that unfolded during those fateful hours. The fight erupted at around 2 a.m. between inmates in two different high security security cell blocks. The prison guards allowed members of Los Zetas to infiltrate cell block D, where the Gulf Cartel members were peacefully sleeping, armed with sharp-edged knives, stones, burning devices, and potentially even firearms. Los Zetas members embarked on a bloody carnage to eliminate their rival cartel members. The victims were then strangled, thrown out of windows, stabbed, beheaded, hanged, bludgeoned, and even crushed. The situation escalated to a point where a guard was taken hostage and to add fuel to that fire, mattresses were set ablaze. Security personnel didn't manage to regain control of the prison until 6 a.m. Approximately 750 inmates were housed within each cell block, with rival drug cartel members typically kept apart. However, not all prisoners could be accounted for, and the authorities quickly began to realize that the riot may have been orchestrated as a smokescreen for a jailbreak. By the time the riot subsided, 44 inmates, reportedly affiliated with the Gulf Cartel, had lost their lives, while 37 inmates associated with Los Zetas managed to escape with the assistance of prison guards. An immediate investigation was launched to determine whether some of the 17 guards on duty colluded in the fight by unlocking the doors between the two wings of the prison. When questioned, the family members of the fugitives admitted that the inmates had meticulously planned the prison break. As investigations commenced. Officials in northern Mexico revealed that Los Zetas, with the aid of several corrupt jail guards, facilitated the escape of 37 fugitives. Furthermore, the family members claimed that the inmates enjoyed certain privileges within the prison walls, such as hosting extravagant parties, bringing in sex workers, and receiving other special permissions from the prison authorities in Apodaca. The mother of one prisoner even disclosed that her son had said the prison operated under the law of Los Zetas, and they were often granted permission to temporarily leave the facility to conduct their illicit activities and come back when they pleased. March 15, 2012, a total of 21 former employees from the Apodaca prison were apprehended, including three high-ranking officials. And by August 3, 2012, 24 out of the 37 fugitives have either been captured or taken down. Number 5. Monterey Highway Tragedy May 13, 2012. A horrifying incident took place near Cadereta, Mexico. The bodies of 43 men and 6 women were found in a mutilated state. They had been decapitated, and their hands and feet had been viciously cut off. Identifying the victims was a challenging task due to the conditions of their bodies. However, certain physical features and tattoos suggested that they might have been migrants from southern Mexico and Central America. What's even more disturbing is that a graphic video emerged online that depicted gunmen dumping the bodies and proudly displaying a narco banner signed by a Los Zetas cartel leader known as El Loco or the Crazy One. The banner issued a chilling warning, stating that rival cartels, the police, and the military aren't immune to meeting the same fate. Although the video can still be found online, the version uploaded on YouTube had been taken down. Frankly speaking, we had no intention of searching for it. What's truly astonishing is that the initial YouTube upload was made by someone claiming to be a member of Los Zetas. Talk about audacity. 
audacity. Following the discovery of the bodies in Cadereta, Los Zeta shocked everyone by posting new narco banners across northern Mexico, condemning the murders. Can you believe it? However, Mexican officials dismissed their actions as an attempt to sow confusion about who was responsible for these deaths. And the authorities even managed to locate El Loco, whose real name is Daniel Elizondo Jesus Ramirez. When the Mexican army arrived to apprehend him, he tried to escape by shooting at the troops and throwing a frag grenade. However, he was eventually captured. During a press conference in Mexico City, the Mexican authorities claimed that El Loco had been instructed to dispose of the bodies in the town square of Cadereta. Instead, he chose to dump them on a nearby highway to instill terror. They stated that El Loco confessed to dumping the corpses and revealed that he had done so under the orders of even more powerful leaders within Los Zetas. El Loco is also a suspect in the kidnapping, murder, and dismemberment of two women in 2011, one whom was the girlfriend of an army lieutenant. El Loco was mistakenly reported that he had been killed during an operation to apprehend the alleged kidnappers. However, he sent a taunting message to the Mexican media that said, I'm still alive. El Loco of Los Zetas. And unfortunately, the people of Nuevo Leon and Tamaulipas are no strangers to the sight of decapitated bodies. These regions rank among the most violent in the country, according to government statistics. In Monterey alone, nearly 400 deaths in 2011 were linked to organized crime, with many victims falling prey to the ruthless Los Zetas. And number six, the Allende Massacre. If you ever decide to visit the city of Allende in Mexico, you'll be greeted by a haunting sight. Abandoned and destroyed farms stretch as far as the eye can see, and the once vibrant community now remains in self-imposed silence. This silence is a painful reminder of the massacre that took place over a decade ago, orchestrated by the notorious Los Zetas as revenge against a snitch. During one daring raid, the DEA managed to seize a staggering amount of cash, over $1. $1 million dollars hidden in a vehicle's tank. The driver, a cartel member, spilled the beans and revealed his boss's identity as Jose Vasquez Jr., also known as El Diablo. El Diablo held the title of the largest cocaine distributor for Los Zetas in Texas, making him a prime target for the U.S. agents. Sensing an opportunity to take down the cartel leaders, the DEA applied pressure on El Diablo by threatening to throw his wife and mother behind bars. Facing with this ultimatum, he reluctantly agreed to provide information about two of Los Zetas' most infamous leaders, the Trevino Morales brothers. To gain an upper hand, El Diablo convinced another Los Zetas member, Hector Moreno, to hand over the tracking numbers of their boss's cell phones. Moreno's responsibility was to procure new cell phones every 15 days for the Trevino Morales family, ensuring their communications remained secure from interception. Armed with this valuable information, El Diablo shared the cell phone data with a unit of the Federal Police of Mexico. Together, they embarked on a mission to track and apprehend the cartel leaders. However, Mexican agents informed the cartel about the leaked information, which made the leaders furious. The cartel immediately suspected Hector and another individual named Jose Luis Garza of being informants. The Trevino Morales brothers plotted revenge against the snitches, but they decided they weren't going to abide by the snitches get stitches rule. Instead, they saw that the entire town must pay the ultimate price. Garza hailed from Allende and came from a wealthy family involved in ranching and coal mining. March 18th, 2011. Dozens of criminals descended upon the town, located the Garza properties, and abducted everyone inside. The gang used heavy machinery to demolish 80 houses and kidnap around 80 families. These people vanished without a trace until the operation began uncovering some of their bodies, many of which were allegedly dissolved in large barrels of makeshift kitchens using a mixture of diesel fuel and caustic soda. The assassins showed no mercy, targeting men, women, the elderly, and children. Anyone with the Garza surname or any connection to the family, even students, athletes, professionals, and innocent residents who had nothing to do with the Garzas disappeared. Their only mistake was being outside on that fateful night. And on the morning of March 19th, the Garza's properties were torn down by backhoes. Homes, warehouses, businesses, and rest houses were all demolished. To make matters worse,
worse, the criminals encouraged the villagers to loot the properties. Entire families swarmed in, taking everything from TVs and appliances to furniture and even the wiring. Nothing was left behind. March 22nd, the 089 emergency system received a staggering 1,451 pleas for help in Allende and Piedras Negras. Shockingly though, not a single response was given. According to the National Human Rights Commission, the municipal police actively participated in the disappearance of people. In the aftermath of the massacre, the entire town fell into a haunting silence that lasted for years. Despite it being an open secret, no one took action. Neither the authorities nor the security forces dared to confront the country's most powerful and bloodthirsty cartel at the time. In most cases, relatives of the disappeared were too terrified to report their loved ones missing, fearing that they would be tracked down and killed. It wasn't until early 2014 that the media shed light on this massacre that occurred in Allende. Even after more than a decade, the population remains on high alert. When they spot a vehicle without license plates from Coahuila or Texas, their expression change. They distance themselves, and unknown men keep a close eye on visitors to the city. The true number of victims from the massacre is still unknown. The farms, even after all these years, still bear the scars of destruction and are filled with garbage. The families of the disappeared continue to hold on to hope, desperately seeking answers about what happened to their loved ones. They live with an unending pain and have been unable to find closure. However, they're still too afraid to speak up.